Um, before starting on the topic of today's talk, I want to introduce my collaborators. Uh, the lead on the project I'm about to tell you about is Andres Daglas, who unfortunately couldn't be here to give the talk because he's defending his PhD and moving across the country in about four days. Um, but this is also a collaboration with two tremendous postdocs, Jason Sardell, who is here at the meeting, and Chenny Cheng, who has left our lab recently. And then lastly, Katie Peichel, who for several years has been our very close collaborator on what I'm about to tell you about. Uh, Katie's now at the University of Bern. So uh, the topic of today is sexually antagonistic selection. As, as we've heard in the last couple of talks, this is a situation where you have a locus with two alleles, one of which is beneficial in males and de detrimental to females. Conversely, the other is beneficial to females and detrimental to males. Uh, we find this topic fascinating for several reasons. One of all, first of all, it's the driver of sexual dimorphism, which is an interesting phenomenon. Secondly, it has important demographic consequences, which I'm not gonna be able to talk about today. But what I will talk about is how this force is thought to be very important in the evolution of sex chromosomes. So several people who have re uh, reviewed this topic, and I'll go through it very quickly. Uh, this comes, this traces back to a, a seminal paper by Brian and Deborah Charlesworth, almost four years old now. And it's a narrative that goes as follows. Ancestrally, sex chromosomes were largely like autosomes. They had a small region that determined sex, but most of the chromosomes, most of the X and Y chromosomes recombined. So at some point, a uh, locus develops a polymorphism with one of these sexually antagonistic pair of alleles. And what that does is set up a situation that favors a change in the recombination on this chromosome. Because we've got an allele that is beneficial for males, for example, because it produces a, a male coloration pattern that is detrimental to females. But because of recombination, that allele that's beneficial for males sometimes finds itself on an X chromosome where it's detrimental to females. So there's selection to shut down recombination and permanently lock the male beneficial allele to the Y chromosome. And that can be done in several ways. The classic way in which this happens is by a chromosome inversion on the Y chromosome, which prevents recombination with the X. And once you have a large region of non-recombining Y chromosome, bad things happen and it degenerates. As we know, absence of sex is not healthy. So that's a narrative that traces back to this 40-year-old paper we have a lot of evidence for several of the steps in that story, except for one. To date, there has not been any evidence, whoops, sorry, I'm getting all excited. Uh, this is how we think we've arrived at this sad situation. These are the, uh, the mammalian sex chromosomes. Here's a nice healthy X chromosome, and this degenerated blob is the Y chromosome, right? So this is the story of how we get to the sex chromosome of mammals and other uh, groups of vertebrates, and, and they're actually invertebrates as well. So, um, the piece that is missing in tests of this hypothesis is actually the very first step. To date, we do not have evidence for sexually antagonistic selection acting on, the, on genes in the recombining region of the sex chromosome. Now, uh, just to give you an acronym or two, I'm, I'm sorry about this, but this is classically called the pseudo-autosomal region. That's the part of the sex chromosome that recombines, and I will, to make life easy for us all, just refer to that as the PAR. The thing you need to know is the PAR is the bit that recombines. And we're gonna ask, is there sexually antagonistic selection acting on genes in the PAR? So, uh, several years ago, Rafael Guerrero and I um, developed a potential pathway to detect that kind of selection, and here's how it goes. Imagine that you could take X chromosomes and Y chromosomes and line them up and go in little sliding windows down the recombining par and ask how much differentiation is there between the X and the Y. So that's what we're gonna graph on the vertical axis. It's the differentiation measured, for example, by FST. And we're gonna do that in these little sliding windows. And what the models, the coalescent models show, is that we expect very high differentiation when we're near the sex determining region but as we go along the uh, recombining par, it will drop off rapidly, except when we reach a spot where there's one of these sexually antagonistic polymorphisms. And then we will light up that spot with a peak of differentiation in the neutral genetic variability around that selected site. So, great, all we have to do is find these peaks. Okay, well, there are a couple of problems with that. Um, before I get to the problems, let me tell you what we're gonna work with. These are stickleback fishes. Um, about 10 years ago, our collaborator Katie Peichel and her collaborators did a survey of several species, and they found every species of stickleback they looked at has a different sex chromosome. 
we're going to focus on this species. This is the Japan sea stickleback, which you may not know about. It's split off from the three-spined stickleback, which everybody and their mothers now do research on. And they are diverged by about two million years. As I'll show you, the three excuse me, the Japan sea stickleback has a unique and very interesting sex chromosome. Um, here it is. <coughs> Here is the uh, ancestral pair of sex chromosomes that are found in the three-spine stickleback as well. But in the Japan sea stickleback, the Y chromosome has fused with an autosome. Bizarre, no? It's true. And what is so cool about that is that we now have a Y chromosome, which has got a very large non-recombining bit, but it's got an even larger recombining pseudo-autosomal region. And why that is so cool is there's now a gigantic target for sexually antagonistic selection to accumulate. Furthermore, in previous QTL studies by Jun Catano and, and company, uh, there are two phenotypes that are thought to be under sexually antagonistic selection that map to that part of the chromosome. So, what a great place to go hunting for sexually antagonistic selection. Um, let's see. Now, what we're going to do then is we're going to sequence these chromosomes and look for divergence, peaks of divergence between the X and the Y. How hard can that be? Well, it turns out it's a little tricky. The problem is that typical or standard sequencing technologies will get you a little one or 200 base pair read that belongs on this part of the chromosome, but when you get the data, you don't know whether it came from the X or the Y. That is to say, you cannot phase the data, as they say. So a lot of people who are interested in this subject have approached it by comparing males and females. That has something to do with the X and the Y chromosome, but unfortunately, a male is a mixture of sequences from X and Y, and it really dilutes your power to detect this thing. So what we did is uh, elected to take a much more um, labor-intensive and expensive uh, methodology and actually experimental and phase the sex chromosomes. And here's how that works. You take, we took a Japan sea male and a three-spined female, hybridized them in the lab. That is a, a cross that produces viable hybrid offspring. You get a son and a daughter, and then you sequence dad, mom, son, and daughter to about 30 X coverage each. And what you do is you look for little bits in the son of sex chromosome that are shared in dad but not in mom. That's gotta be on the Y chromosome and little bits in the daughter that are on a sex chromosome that's in dad but not mom, that came in on an X. So we get entire phase X and Y chromosomes. And we did, that, did this on 15 of these families, so we've got a sample of um, 30 phased sex chromosomes, 15 Xs and 15 Ys. So those are the data we're working with. Um, and <clears throat> I'm not gonna show you all of the data. As a matter of fact, we've got phased entire genomes I'm gonna focus on this little portion of the recombinant par. And the reason is that the coalescent models tell us that these peaks of differentiation are strongest when you're pretty close to the edge of the sex determining region. You're not too far away. And so, and also you don't wanna be right up against the sex determining region because that's when you get this big peak of differ differentiation even if there's no sex antagonistic, <clears throat> antagonistic selection. So, we're gonna look at this four megadase region and here are the data. So this is the edge of the sex determining region. And we're going, uh, taking a little gap so we don't get too close. Doing this four megabase uh, region going to the right. And what you're seeing is uh, in these dots are the average FST values between the X and the Y chromosome for all the SNPs that are within a 10 kb window. Why 10 kb? Because that's about the, the uh, size of the linkage to equilibrium in these stickleback. So we've got all these uh, 10 kb windows. What's the gray stuff? For each window, we randomize the labels of X and Y chromosome, recalculate FST, rinse and repeat that a million times, and we get a null distribution for what that should look like. That's what the density of the gray dots is showing us. Okay, all right. So, drum roll please, do we see any peaks of differentiation? What we find is that there are four windows that show significant differentiation between X and Y. And let me tell you now what I mean by significant, and you can decide whether or not you want to buy in. Um, these windows, so we're doing a couple of comparisons, right? And these windows each are uh, significant 
with a false discovery rate of 0 0.13, meaning for any particular window of any of those four dots, there's about a 13% chance it's a false positive. However, the probability that all four of those are false positives, meaning none of them are real, is 10 to the minus four. So what we are saying is, we're not gonna stake our lives on any particular peak, but we're pretty sure that at least one and probably three or four of those are real peaks of differentiation. So that's our evidence. Now, uh, everybody wants to know, well, what are those peaks? And let's zoom in on one of them. So here's a blow up of that particular FST peak. Uh, this is a much smaller region of gray. This is the actual wind 10 kg window itself. Now these dots are the individual SNPs. FST once again going up all the way to 0.4, so a lot of differentiation. Um, that peak is sort of interesting because it lies on top of the coding region. And that's shown by this green box here. And inside that coding region, four of the SNPs are non sum so they change the protein uh, that is produced from the coding region. If we look at all four of the regions, all four of the windows that are high FST peaks, two of the four overlap with coding regions. The other one that has an overlap also has two non sum SNPs in it. And the other two windows, the windows three and four out of the four, are within seven kV of coding regions. So pretty surprisingly, every single one of these high differentiated windows is really close or actually within a gene. And the chance that you get that much overlap with coding regions by chance is quite small. Now, the next question, of course, is, well, what are the genes? And um, the stickleback genome is not quite as well known or uh, annotated as the human genome, but we can ask, what are the homologs of those proteins? Here they are in humans. What are those names? Well, there's some damn genes, I don't know. But you can look at what their functions are in humans. And here's the deal. All four of those windows <laughs> overlap with proteins implicated in psych psychiatric disorders in humans. Now, the study of psychiatric disorders in sticklebacks is not very well advanced. <laughs> so we cannot tell you what the function these genes are in fish. But what we can tell you is that these two psychiatric diseases have for a long time been associated with sexually antagonistic selection and dependency. So that's what we know. Those are my conclusions. Experimentally phased sex chromosomes give the first evidence of sexually antagonistic selection. The four peaks of differentiation and divergence between X and Y are in or near genes associated with sexually antagonistic selection in humans. And uh, these are the conditions which going forward in time would favor reduced combination between X and Y as postulated by a classic model for the evolution of sex chromosomes. Thank you. antagonistic selection, which is to go and measure it, measure it in the field and see it. Mm -hmm. So if you do that and you find QTL for those traits that are sexually antagonistic on the pseudoautosomal region, would that not be evidence for sexually antagonistic selection being a part of what's in the PAR? Yes, and I, and I thought I did mention that there is evidence of two QTLs on the PAR. There is evidence Oh, two two keyouts which have putative, <laughs> sexually antagonistic In Cyclidium there's evidence for sexually antagonistic selection in the field and QTL in the park. I'm sorry. Yes. And so maybe what, let's follow, follow up. Uh, I just got gonged out. <laughs> but I think what I meant to say, which I didn't say clearly, is evidence at the molecular level. That's not how you said it. Uh, my apologies. <laughs>